Welcome everyone. Thank you for joining us for this webinar on the state of modern political economy. We're excited to see so many of you joining us from around the world. We've had a ton of emails from people in different countries who are planning to dial in. We um, have about, I think, 50% of attendees who are students, alumni, friends of the Tamer Center, Executive Education, Columbia University. And another 50% of you are former students of Professor Ray Horton and a course called Modern Political Economy. So for those of you that don't know, NPE, as we fondly refer to this course, has been taught at Columbia Business School for a couple of decades now. And Ray, if you don't know, Ray is retiring at the end of this fiscal year, very sad about that. Um, however, he is handing over the reins of the course um, to two esteemed faculty colleagues, our former Dean and Professor Glenn Hubbard and Professor Tano Santos. And so we're thrilled that all three of them are able to join. And we also hope that after Ray retires, he still plans to be uh, helping with the transition of that course and, and contributing to Columbia Business School and with our social enterprise activities in other ways. So we're thrilled that um, all three of us are joining us. And just as I mentioned, this word webinar is being recorded. We will send out the link to everyone who registered and it will be available online. And we would love to hear from you through the Q&A feature in Zoom. If you see there's a text box, you can both enter your questions and also upvote questions. And that will help filter it to the top of my queue so I can make sure we try and address this. We do have a hard stop for one of our speakers at 7.30. However, depending on how Q&A goes, we will see if there's a few more minutes um, to get to any of those burning, interesting questions. So with that, I'd love to turn it over to our beloved professor, Ray Horton. Ray. Thanks, Sandra. Um, first of all, thanks for organizing this event. and. I think even more important, thanks for all that you've done over the years in really directing the growth of the social enterprise program and the Tamer Center. We're all deeply indebted to you for that. Um, so I do have mixed feelings about retiring. Um, on the other hand, I'm really happy that uh, MPE is going to live on with the um, uh, sort of talents of my really good friends and colleagues, Glenn Hubbard, and Tano Santos, and I'm glad I can help a little bit in the transition. Um, we put together a, uh, I think, really nice new syllabus during uh, December and January, um, and we were all set to roll it out in the fall, but of course the, the pandemic hit us, so now we have, uh, you know, we have some major changes that we're gonna have to make in the syllabus, and maybe in a sense, what y'all are gonna to hear tonight would be sort of our early musings on the impact of the virus on modern politi political economy. I decided because so many people uh, that are listening are former students of uh, modern political economy at the business school that I would sort of cast my remarks about the coronavirus uh, impact on political economy in the context of the courses I've taught it for uh, 25 years. So I want to make um, four basic points. First, that those of you who took it in the 1990s will remember that by the end of the 20th century, um, there was very good reason to be optimistic about the practice of modern political economy in the world at large and in the United States. Democratic capitalism or the kind of liberal political model that uh, the United States practiced was on the rise throughout the world. Um, and in America, you had a, a leader with, with um, top dog status in the totem pole of international politics that with the help of Europe um, was, was positioned to sort of bring the outliers over time into the American democratic uh, capitalist model. Uh, so appear, everything appeared to be coming up roses, at least to me, um, at the end of the 20th century. Second, things began to fall apart very fast in the 21st century. There were a succession of setbacks to the American model of political economy, 
Uh, not so much 9-11, um, but we headed back into a heavy deficit period as a result of um, uh, wars uh, and uh, fiscal policy. Um, we had, of course, the 2008 financial crisis followed by the Great Recession. We began to see uh, the rise of right-wing populism and then, of course, the election of uh, Donald Trump. And in Europe, you see a series of uh, setbacks, um, including um, financial crises, an immigration tsunami, and again, the rise of authoritarian populist leaders uh, in Europe. So very early in the 21st century, stunningly rapid in my perspective, you begin to see three major tidal waves of change in political economy. One is the decline of democracy, which had been on the rise for decades, um, fueled, I think, by the rise of authoritarian pop populists. Second, you begin to see a decline in internationalism and multilateral relationships, fueled again by the rise in a nationalist sentiment that in turn is fueled, I think, by the authoritarian populists. And third, you begin to see a not so slow, not so gradual shift in the redistribution of international power from the United States to China. From my perspective, um, as a liberal, an American, a Westerner, and an internationalist, these are all baleful developments, bad things that are going on in the political economy of the United States and the world beginning early in the 21st century. And now third, we get hit by the virus, um, which is having a devastating impact on uh, people um, and uh, the economy not only in the United States, but I think what we'll see throughout the rest of the world as well. And so our focus uh, is really very much right now on when's it gonna end and what are the steps we have to take in order for it to end? And I don't have the answer to any of those things, obviously, but my fear is that the virus and its impact is going to have a reinforcing or accelerating effect on the underlying dynamics that I talked about a minute ago. I think it's going to, I think it's quite possible it will strengthen the hand of authoritarian leaders throughout, that is in the democratic countries throughout the world. We don't have many populist leaders uh, in China or Russia. Um, Secondly, I think it's definitely going to fuel a continued rise in nationalism and a continued assault on multilateralism and international uh, agencies. And finally, uh, maybe most clearly, I think it's going to intensify the conflict between the United States and China. So um, the virus is going to end, but the world is going to be harder to repair after it and because of it. Now I'm gonna end, if I can, on a slightly more optimistic note. One of the things I've learned in teaching modern political economy over the last 25 years is that things are never quite as bad or as good as they seem. Euphoria or despair can cause us to overlook things that are kind of under the surface that we might otherwise put our, uh, put, uh, sort of understand and recognize. I think back on how easy it was at the turn of the 20, 20, at the end of the 20th century, how we failed to recognize the corrosive effects of many of the policies um, in the 1980s and the 1990s that sort of build up this wave of populism and authoritarian leadership. And so I wonder today in this, for me at least, period of awesome pessimism about the future, if there are some equilibrating factors that we're not recognizing, or maybe all I'm saying is I'm not recognizing, that might lead to a somewhat rosier future than appears uh, the case at me. And I would think about, I will leave with just one of them. Um, and that is, I think it's possible, increasingly possible, that one effect of the pandemic is going to be to wreak such devastation on the economy 
and on the public health that the American people will elect a new president in uh, November of this year. And that to me would be a small step forward in an otherwise complicated world. We'd have one less authoritarian leader. Um, we'd have one less uh, advocate for a virulent nationalism. And we'd have a more collaborative leadership with respect to China, all of which would make me very happy. So with that, I'm going to turn the floor over to my good friend and colleague, Glenn Hubbard. Thanks, uh, thanks, Ray, and thanks everybody for, for joining this. Uh, I'll just say that I may be the optimist in the group. Uh, I have played that role as a guest lecturer for Ray. He's been kind enough to have me in class. And I'm very optimistic about uh, the nation's ability to reinvent itself. I won't say too much about it in opening remarks, but I'm sure it'll come out in, in Q&A. How did I come to this class? Uh, partly as a dean and former dean and partly as an economist. As a dean, I always felt that MBA students lacked the context for business decision-making, historical, social, political context. I don't know an effective leader that's not good at that. As an economist, I felt there were lots of interesting topics we just weren't covering in the MBA program, the role of the state, uh, the balance of power within and across uh, nations, should you have decentralized or centralized responses to particular things. And so in terms of the course, uh, I felt MPE was and is incredibly important. And I agree with Ray that nothing we're seeing here is particularly new. We'll see an accentuation and acceleration of debates over the function of the executive, over nationalism, not just in the US, but say the European experiment and concern over democratic institutions. So for the course, that's why I'm excited. Now about COVID. Uh, I think COVID was uh, tailor-made for MPE and it has to radically change the way we teach it. And I'll just give two simple examples. When I tried to explain the economics of the pandemic to politicians, just as it was unfolding, I said, imagine two curves. One is a curve about a, uh, an infection rate, and another is concern, a curve about costs to the macro economy. The problem is those two curves are in opposition to one another. So the, in the short run, when we push hard on the slope of the infection rate, second derivative and the first derivative for math aficionados, we're gonna raise the macroeconomic cost in the near term, even though we know we have to do it. Now, why are those two curves a metaphor for MPE? On the health side, we're already seeing this pay, play out. In a disaster, is a market solution better, like a decentralized allocation or a centralized solution? What do you need to know? We know in World War II, we used a centralized solution. In World War I, we actually used a hybrid of the two in the class, we talk about debates between, say, Friedman and Hayek, who might have been on the decentralized camp, versus more centralizing uh, camps as well, like Galbraith and others. And you know, I think this disaster really raises that. And the question of what is the responsibility of an individual, a business, or a government? On macro, there are two really big questions that fall out of the crisis naturally. One is what's the government's role in offsetting a shock? We saw within the past few weeks, the passage of two bills, one costing more than $2 trillion, for what it's worth, my own math says it'll cost much more, but even $2 trillion is a lot of money. And we just had one for another 500 billion. Those were unthinkable just a year or two ago. So what is government's role here? Is government doing the right thing? Uh, what is the role of the state in tail risks and so on? That's an important topic uh, historically in MPE. It'll be very important here. And then concerns about bigness, going back to debates uh, between uh, arguments for the large corporations in the middle of the 20th century versus the reaction from Friedman, Friedman Hayek, and others that no, uh, the large corporation could be inefficient. Here we've got biggest concerns again. We are seeing a mass failure of mom and pop businesses and an acceleration of concentration trends uh, in, in the economy. This is political, it's not just economics. So course and COVID now to fit. On context, uh, I would build on what Ray said to say there's 
some examples leading into the excitement of having the pandemic in the class. What is the financial crisis? I always felt that the financial crisis was not just an economic experiment. It was an experiment in political economy. As a nation, and not to, uh, atypically from other nations, we bailed out financial institutions, which, by the way, I think was more or less the correct policy. We did not do anything for many average people. And the political fallout from that uh, has lasted for years. It has fueled a populist wave that was already in the making. Uh, many of you may know we've uh, had Ray and I and others have led students for the past few years on trips in the country to places in which this populist furor took over after the financial crisis. Another is a re-questioning that MPE is tailor-made for of the role of business in society. This year is the 50th anniversary of Milton Friedman's New York Times piece, that shareholder value maximization is the touchstone. It touched off a debate in 1970. It's retouching off one today in 2020 with battles over corporate purpose tailor-made for MPE. The other thing I really like about MPE is the marriage of the old and the new. The course begins with a tour d'horizon of grandmasters, people like Adam Smith, and Malthus, and Marx, Keynes, and others, whose ideas not only were important in economics, they shaped public policy in the world around them, but they weren't just people of their day. Their ideas uh, continue to, to hold sway. So some of the challenges we'll talk about in the class about disputes over trade, uh, technological change, the pandemic ex itself, all have roots in debates that go back to these uh, great folks thinking. We'll talk in the class as well about consequences for business strategy, globalization versus deglobalization, for example, and business leadership. What's the role of businesses in advancing their workers or on a bigger stage, advancing the nation's role uh, in the world? Going forward, I expect as we finish redesigning the class, we'll be using the pandemic as a way to tease out these questions about the role of business and society and the role of the state and society, and the role of markets. Just to close uh, with where I began, I, I am optimistic of this nation's and many nations' ability to regenerate themselves. I wrote some comments, which will be posted to the MBA graduates of, of 2020, since uh, I started them. They're sort of half mine and half, uh, half the new deans, where I reminded them that leadership is a special responsibility. Uh, they will prevail, but they are not alone. And they can never be alone because they have to lead men and women for business purpose and social purpose. They can only do that with context. That's why I'm excited about the class. So uh, thank you very much, uh, Ray. Thank you very much, Glenn. And thank you very much, Sandra, for putting all this together. Uh, it's, uh, it's wonderful. I'm equally excited uh, as Ray and Glenn are to be teaching this class in the fall semester. It, we couldn't have planned it any better. I think it's going to be a remarkable period to discuss all these issues. And of course, the pandemic is bringing um, many, many fault lines in our societies to the front uh, that need uh, exploring with the students. And as Glenn said, we, you know, we need to understand uh, uh, the global uh, environment to understand how corporations and businesses are going to be progressing in the years to come. Now, uh, you know, they've touched on, you know, both Ray and Glenn have touched on many topics. So uh, I bring to this uh, modern political economy perhaps the uh, European uh, viewpoint. Uh, and uh, so let me talk a little bit about that and what is that um, is going to be different relative to uh, previous courses on modern political economy. And I want to pick up on something that uh, uh, Ray said. The current crisis, the current pandemic that we're living uh, through puts an enormous strain in the set of international institutions built over the last 30, 40 years. Institutions, of course, that are the result of profound changes in the organization of uh, uh, production at a global scale. And the European Union in particular, the European of the Maastricht Treaty, uh, and the Eurozone in particular are, is typically forgotten, two of the most successful of the globalized uh, or globalization institutions that came out of that optimism and can-do attitude of the 1990s. 
Now, it is, of course, the case that the nations of Europe are interlinked in a way that is absolutely unprecedented. We have very little historical uh, precedence to uh, the European experiment. So predicting the evolution of the crisis in Europe uh, is going to be challenging, and we're going to explore that in the modern political economy course when we talk about how all these things come together in a globalized uh, world. So instability in Europe, it's uh, worth remembering, is never good. Uh, you know, we've had a lot of experiences over the last 100 years of what instability in Europe means for uh, world relations, uh, uh, the United States in particular, and the entire world. So it is obvious that crises always expose deep fractures and fault lines in societies. And in this, this pandemic is uh, no different. Now, what is unique uh, uh, about Europe is that this fracture manifests itself always in some familiar tones with a divide between North and South, between a supposedly thrifty North and an undisciplined South. And I'm from Spain, so I get, uh, you know, this scorn look from my German friends every time we get into trouble. And European crisis always result in the same commentary, particularly in the side of the Atlantic regarding a possible breakup of the European uh, Union and of the monetary union in particular. Now, I don't know what is going to happen and I don't want to claim and we're not going to basically make forecast on what is going to happen in the world at large. Uh, you know, we're going to give you the tools to understand uh, the evolution of uh, particular events, but prediction is always a difficult and dangerous game. Um, but, uh, you know, let me just give you some things that may help uh, you understand, at least in the next few weeks and months, what is going to happen in Europe. So if you want to understand the future evolution of the European Union and of the Eurozone, you have always have to ask yourself whether the reasons that brought these countries together in such a unique experiment in the first place remain operational today. And this is a question that uh, particularly U.S. economists always fail to ask themselves every time they think about the monetary union. My contention is that for most of the European countries, those reasons that brought them together in the first place remain operational today. And in this, I share Glenn's optimism, with the exception perhaps of the country that is always the exception in Europe, which is, of course, Italy. Now think about it. For the Northern European countries, such as Germany and the Netherlands, the monetary union has involved a fantastic transfer from the South to the North in the form of a depreciated exchange rate. If we don't think that the world to come is one where competition for weak external demand is going to be fierce, well, certainly that's not a world in which you want to see your currency appreciate. Germany, and more precisely the German establishment, understands this fully. But these Southern European countries, what do they get? Well, they certainly get what they always got of the European institutions, which is commitment. Okay, and what is that commitment good for? Well, let me give you a small example, okay? Given the age populations of countries such as Spain and Italy, depending on pensions, for instance, to the maintenance of the real value of uh, the standards of living, well, price stability seems more important now than ever. Now, given the importance and how age populations are in these countries, this creates a powerful constituency for price stability. And you get that price stability by tying your monetary fortunes to a stern European Central Bank imbued of Germanic discipline when it comes to all things monetary, okay? In addition, building on something that Ray said, populist forces are growing in Europe. Now, they're not yet dominant, but of course, they can destabilize the political environment in Europe. So the crisis is creating a remarkable alliance between seniors who want to see their pensions protected and the more moderate elements of society that want to put a limit to radical policy experiments. And yet again, the European Union and the Eurozone provide uh, constraints on those radical uh, policy experiments that perhaps some of these populist parties uh, uh, may want to do in the near future. Now, all this, of course, has always an exception in Italy because that direct subsidy from the South to the North in the form of exchange rate has completely decimated Italy and Italy's manufacturing sector unable to compete in a globalized world with the likes of Germany or China. In every single paper evaluating the first 20 years of the Euro, Italy, 
comes out as the country that has benefited the least from the monetary union. And that's something important to remember for the future evolution of the EU and of the monetary union in particular. Think about it the following way. Spain and Germany are very complementary. Germany produces and sells fancy cars and they spend the proceeds from those sales in rather wild vacations in Mallorca, Spain. The complementary with Italy is much less obvious. It is indeed unclear whether the reforms that Italy needs to understate can take place under the harsh constraints of the euro. But you also have to ask yourself, can they take place outside the euro? Don't think the Italians don't understand this, don't understand the secular failure of uh, structural reforms in Italy by the political class in Italy. The problems are deep and it's not clear whether they're ameliorated inside or outside the Europe. So now mistakes happen and they can happen in Europe as well. God knows we've made many, many mistakes before. And certainly there's a limited reservoir of goodwill that the Europeans have towards the EU institutions. Let me be very clear, Europeans are not enamored of the EU, but they know what it does and what it brings to them in terms of benefits nationally. Follow the money, always follow the money. And in understanding the future evolution of the EU and the Euro in particular, always ask yourself who benefits inside of each member nation of continued membership in the Euro. In that sense, the lesson that I got from the global financial crisis, it seems to me is very similar to the one that Glenn took. Political economy is paramount and bringing forth all these political e economy elements in different societies as we face the different challenges uh, with this pandemic and the new crisis that will surely come is going to be a key ingredient of our modern political economy class in the fall of 2020. Ray and Glenn and Tano, would you like to have a few minutes to comment on each other's comments? Well, I, I, um, this is why uh, modern political economy is going to be a better course because we have uh, two really good economists who bring some things to the course that I, a political scientist, um, was never able to bring to the course. Um, and the other thing, of course, that I think is good um, is they're both pretty optimistic. And I, I sort of feel like um, I'm so pessimistic at this stage of the game. I would be a complete downer if I were teaching this course all by myself going forward. So <laughs> I'm really glad to have not only a couple of really good friends and smart people, but two good economists who bring a degree of optimism. And I think it goes back to the point that I made in my conclusion, and that is there are equilibrating forces out there, which I think economists have a way of understanding better than any other social science discipline. So I think for many reasons, what you've seen in the comments of Glenn and Tano um, is really proof positive that this is gonna be an even better course going forward. Well, I don't wanna sell past the close of economics as the best discipline. I think I just leave, <laughs> exactly. it. <laughs> leave it alone. No, but if I can add one thing, I mean, I think there's one topic that uh, that will come up often in the class and that uh, goes squarely into the political science realm, which is this thing that Glenn mentioned of this transferring of power from Congress to the executive branch that we see not just in the United States, by the way, but in many other countries. Political scientists are already uh, collect collecting data on this. And it's just pervasive across many different countries where for whatever reason, deliberative bodies are not working as well as they once did. And uh, we'll have to explore that issue. How come we keep transferring power from Congress or parliaments around the world onto the executive to take decisions? And I think this pandemic will accelerate that trend precisely because some of the things that Glenn was mentioning, they need to coordinate to internalize these negative externalities. Any other final thoughts? No, we'll turn it over to you. Yeah. Okay. So looking at your questions from the audience, I encourage folks to um, submit their questions. We have a question from Matt Cantwell, an Ember Global 2011 graduate. Um, he says, thank you for the distinguished panel. What is the US government's appropriate response to China in regards to COVID? So I'm, I'm of the uh, camp that these uh, 
a substantial redistribution of power away from the United States and toward China over the last 20 years. And what I also see in the United States that troubles me a lot is a real virulent buildup of an anti-Chinese uh, mood. You don't just see it from the sort of conservative uh, uh, part of the Republican Party. You see it from liberal institutions like the New York Times over the last four or five years. The Times sentiment toward China has changed substantially. I, I worry very much that um, we're heading into a, con a heavy conflict period with China. And I, you know, I think collaboration is really important for a variety of reasons, not only collaboration in terms of trying to end this pandemic, but more important collaboration on issues like climate change and many other where collective action really bumps up to the level of the most powerful nation state. So I'm, I'm worried about the direction we're headed in. And that's one reason why I hope that uh, Joe Biden is elected the next president, because I think he will have a somewhat more collaborative and somewhat less conflictual uh, set of feelings about China. I think for China, we need to both uh, collaborate and compete. I, I agree with Ray that the past 20 years of China policy, whether it's um, in foreign affairs or economic policy has not been optimal for the United States. I do think the Chinese leadership, as opposed to the Chinese people, draw a big distinction there, has been a bad actor on the international stage. And China's conduct of itself uh, post-accession of the WTO, and I was one of the people that pushed the president to let China in the WTO. Uh, I believe that China has not lived up to its rules. And if I were to advise Mr. Trump on this, I would say we need a coordinated multilateral effort to discipline China on the global stage. That would not be a one-off US versus China. It would not mean upsetting our European allies, Japan, Canada, all of our natural allies. It would be coming together into a WTO challenge because it's not obvious to me China belongs in the WTO. Its rules for subsidies are not going away for a variety of political economy reasons within China. I'm more optimistic that the US wins any race with China. I don't believe China's economic system can win a race uh, against the United States. But I do think it's in our interest to cooperate with China, as Ray suggests, on matters of global public goods, and at least not to antagonize one another uh, needlessly. But I, I do worry about the real concern about the Chinese leadership morphing over into an anti-China or anti-Chinese people attitude, which I share Ray's concern is, is inappropriate. So I, I, I agree. I'm not uh, optimistic, I have to say. Um, I think, of course, any uh, sentiment uh, against the Chinese people is inappropriate. We should be thinking in terms of policy uh, uh, when it comes to this matter. Uh, I would add uh, to the collaborate and compete, uh, probably a third C, which is contain. My fear is that in the next uh, f you know, few months or years, uh, a cold, kind of a Cold War mentality is going to develop uh, in the American foreign policy establishment to contain China. I think the lesson as a foreigner, uh, I, you know, it seems to me the American uh, foreign policy establishment took from the Cold War is that the strategy of containment worked and led to, um, you know, a resounding uh, victory in the late 80s, and I'm wondering whether we're going to get a repeat of uh, some of the things that we saw after the Second uh, World War. I think a Cold War II uh, is probably in the interest of uh, the Chinese Communist Party and perhaps of the US as well. That worries me enormously. So that on the part of containment uh, uh, from a power competition point of view. But I think Glenn is absolutely right. There's a lot of room for collaboration. We're much more integrated than the US economy ever was with the Soviet Union. And that uh, basically establishes links with China of collaboration that uh, you know matters related to public health as it's uh, 
painfully obvious in the current crisis. And then there's the issue of competition. I don't have any doubt whatsoever in my mind about the ability of the United States to compete. It's a more dynamic uh, freedom and democracy help enormously when it comes to this. The uh, assurances that uh, the fruit of your labor will be protected by um, you know, the enforcement of property rights and so on and so forth. These are fundamental institutions and we should not question them um, ever. But it is true that at some point, uh, China will have to be held accountable for policies, particularly in what concerns state aid, that are completely at odds with the spirit of the WTO. And I don't know how to tackle that and uh, how to have that, uh, that uh, multilateral conversation with China that is required. I think the EU and the United States have enough leverage to pull that off, but that requires clearly a different attitude right now in the federal government towards um, you know, multilateral institutions and multilateral relations when it comes to China. And let me, if I might, just jump in on the containment point, because I think what Tano says is important. We're almost ceding the world stage to China. Absolutely. So we, we say contain, we need to be first more active to stop the inroads that they've made. So for example, the Chinese Belt and Road Initiative, the uh, large um, public loans in uh, Sub-Saharan Africa, all of these are global adventures that the United States, not too long ago, would have been in a lead position on. And I think in some sense, we shouldn't uh, be too critical of the Chinese pushing on an open door. We had just gotten out of the way and let them do it. That's the mistake. So, you know, China may have its own accounting, but we need to hold our political leaders accountable too. Yeah, so thank you for that. And I think there was a question about how we would derate multilateral organizations' response to the virus. Uh, I think you touched on that. Do you have specific thoughts about what you would change in how they respond? Or is this a EU and America going at separately? Well, you know, Sandra. I, I, I could try that first. So the multilateral institutions and the virus response, I think first one begins country by country with information. There's just enormous global variation in testing. So if you look at the information basis for health policy, it's just very different. I mean, I get worried in the United States when I hear people talk about an infection rate or a mortality rate. Those are numbers where we know a numerator and we don't know the denominator and yet they're elemental for modeling. So I think step one is guidelines for nations on testing, on containment. I think the uh, World Health Organization made some missteps at the beginning, but so too did many national governments. I think we needed to have invested more, not just we, the United States, but the world in having a better global public health infrastructure so that we have this information more readily available. Because people talk about policy responses but unless and until you know the information, it's almost meaningless to talk about policy. Related is a question from Wissam about, you know, ignoring the questionable statistics maybe that are coming out of China. They were able to get the virus under control a little bit quicker than the United States. Um, what, and he's asking, at what point do you question the fundamental ways in which democracy functions or does not function? Yeah. Is our version the right way to do it? I mean, that's a stunning example of the difference between the Chinese and American political systems at this stage of the game. Glenn earlier mentioned that he sees a fundamental weakness in the, in the uh, economic system of, of communist China, and I don't disagree with that. But the flip side of that is the incredible weakness and fragmentation and inability to operate on any effective level of the American political system at this stage of the game. Not only do we have a leaderless uh, executive branch or a, I wouldn't say a leaderless executive branch, but an executive branch that doesn't really know what it's doing from one day to the other. Um, we have enormous conflicts between states and localities our private sector can't get organized in part because it has no leadership from the federal government. We're dealing with a broken political system and until we figure out how to at least reform it in some basic respects, we're gonna be continue to be dragged down by that in our relationship, our power relationship with China. Yeah, 
if I can add uh, one thing to this, um, and building on comments both by Ray and Glenn, I think a crisis such as this one uh, highlights the need for enormous coordination. Um, think about, you know, the decision to say at the beginning of February, I was very impressed as a European living in this country after so many years with the response of the private sector, which is we go all home. The university goes home, we send the students back, we are going to do our classes by Zoom. Yeah, uh, the investment banks were sending their workers back to their homes to do remote working. But, and that is wonderful. It imposes a positive externality on everyone. The fewer of us are walking around, the less transmission there is. So the private sector took the lead, and that tells you something wonderful about the dynamism of the private sector in the United States, even in the presence of a global pandemic like the one we're going through. Now, going back is a different decision because when we all decide to go back at the same time, we impose a negative externality on everyone. That's where the coordination of the central government is needed. So this is a perfect situation where, in a way, you need a contingent federal state, a state that can kick in when there's a massive negative externality to be managed, whether a war, as Glenn was mentioning before, as a pandemic, as it is today. So we need this coordination. My fear is that somehow we're going to judge our democratic institutions precisely by why they do worse, which is precisely the centralized um, uh, decision taking that, uh, that uh, democracies are not very good at by the very nature, because you know, decision making in a democracy should be decentralized, should be the agglomeration of individual uh, decisions that are taken at the local level. But from time to time, it's very good to have it at centralized level. This is one example of this. Drawing from Manning's question, um, we're talking about the intervention of the US government, and the US obviously has deep inequality issues, as do many countries around the world. Do you think the virus has worsened this? And what can government do to fix this problem? Well, I, I, th I think the answer is pretty clear that it's going to deepen the inequality issue. But at the same time, it may serve the salutary effect of making more Americans aware of how unequal American society is in some respects. So my guess is that, assuming again that there's a change in national leadership in November, is that there will be a more meaningful attack on the problem of inequality, in part because of the uh, obviousness of the, of the effects of the virus. I, I agree with that. I think the virus accentuates a problem that was already there. We have significant inequality in both the distributions of income and wealth. The question is what to do about it. And there too, the virus has shown us something. We've seen Americans fall into two groups, you know, Ray or Tano or myself or Sandra, everybody on this call probably complains about working from home right now. But we are working. We are being compensated for what we do. We are still mindfully and professionally enjoying our careers. That is not true for many low wage workers. And it's not true for many people who are called quote essential workers, whether they're high wage or low wage workers. And I think this may bolster a coalition to do what the country has should have been doing for the past couple of decades, which is making work pay, which is to both uh, encourage training and skill support, but to give wage supports uh, for people to be continuously attached to work. You know, it's quite interesting in the debate over what to do about COVID-19, it's interesting that both the left and the right did center on as much as possible trying to keep people employed. That's a good sign. And if we can build on that, the notion of supporting work and supporting wages, maybe we can turn this disaster into at least something positive. Yes, I think in, the, in that sense, I agree with both uh, Ray and Glenn on this. This crisis can, can be a catalyst uh, for something. If it's well managed and if we can have a reasonable conversation of where this leaves us, I think it's absolutely right. These trends on inequality were persisting. They were related to mostly automatization and to some extent to globalization as well. And those things will remain to some extent, uh, automatization for sure. Uh, globalization, well, the world is becoming more service-oriented. Services are more supplied locally 
So that's less subject to the globalization force to which manufacturing was so much uh, exposed to, so to speak. Um, I think these investments on human capital, on retraining, on reorienting some of our workforce to uh, the new service jobs, education, leisure, healthcare, you name it, uh, it's an important to-do list uh, for policymakers, not just in the United States, but in many places. Now, this is a big, big challenge, and it's going to require thinking in a very different way relative to the way we've thought about um, uh, economic stabilization and transformation and evolution relative to the past. Because, you know, the last time we saw something like this, which was during the 1920s and 30s, when people going from the agricultural sector to the manufacturing sector, that was a relatively easy transition. Going from a world of manufacturing to a world of services, that's a difficult transition. The set of skills that are needed to succeed in that environment are very different. They are the type of skills that we teach in a business school. So I think we're well positioned to benefit from that. Uh, but you know, we need to essentially retrain our entire workforce in this new set of skills. Um, there was a question about the balance of power between federal and state level. Do you think the pandemic has changed your opinion given the federal dysfunction about where the balance of power should lie? I don't think so. I mean, the, the federal budget power is the only weapon we really have right now for the pandemic. And one thing that surprised me pleasantly, even though I don't agree with every aspect of every policy that's been passed, was how quick it was. Congress, the president, the Fed all dithered a bit in 2008. That didn't happen here at all. Everything moved very, very fast for whether you like it or not. You can't blame uh, dithering. I think we learn a lot from a federalist system. I think some governors are doing things we will ultimately learn from. But I think the federal government has to do more for states in two respects. One is public health infrastructure because of all the externalities that Tano mentioned. The other is the state Medicaid programs. There's a state budgets are kind of a complicated patchwork quilt and you pull one piece of the quilt out and the whole thing can unravel. If you have much higher Medicaid spending, which is the program largely for low income Americans, as a result of the pandemic, and we know lower income people are hit harder than higher income people, it can cause states to cut spending on everything else. And that everything else is education, police, fire, social services. Unlike the federal government, the state has no ability uh, to, to borrow large amounts of money for current consumption. So I think we need, I think we need both. I share Ray's view that the federal government's working less optimally than I would like but saying, let the states just do it by themselves, I don't think that's the right answer either. I think you need the muscle of the federal government, and they are at least active. I think you need the muscle of the federal government, but you also need clear messages and clear leadership about things. I, um, um, I am a little worried about 50 states going in 15 different directions without paying a lot of attention to um, some of the larger national issues. But I don't disagree in general with what you said, Glenn. Can I add my one, one small comment on this, which is I think leadership matters. I think we have very resilient societies, very robust uh, states and public administrations. Uh, this is one of the wonders of the modern world that uh, you know they keep operating even when you have uh, this functional leadership, because most of the time that leadership is not needed given how many rules and procedures we have to operate under normal uh, conditions. But leadership matters precisely when you have a once in a lifetime event. And that's when you want that leadership to kick in and provide direction, uh, comfort, uh, whatever it is that is needed in that particular moment. Uh, so it, it's leadership by exception. You need it from time to time. And you need it precisely on the tails of the distribution of things that we don't observe very often and for which our administrative state is not well suited. There's a nice question from Lindy Gold, who references another course that Ray and Glenn have been involved in, Bridging the American Divide, offered at the Business School. What do you see as the long-term impacts of the virus on rural America and places already struggling? And do you think they will that the virus will transform the economies of rural post-manufacturing communities? 
I think it's a great question. I do know that the virus has put the problems of rural America in higher relief. The problems were there before uh, joblessness, uh, social pathologies with drugs and alcohol, uh, economic deprivation. I'm not sure that the virus caused those things, but it certainly has shown a light on them and, and made them worse. I'm not sure what the right policy is. I, I used to think it was simply you know, making sure people move to wherever opportunity is. But one thing we've learned in the student trips to Youngstown and Decatur, uh, Alabama, that the school has done, is that there's a lot of stickiness in a community. It's not just moving uh, people to jobs. You may have to move jobs to people. And there's some interesting things that local businesses in these places are doing with community colleges and other groups to uh, make things better. There too, leadership matters. It's gotta be the case that the local business community and the local politicians uh, really get in the act. National politicians come to these places only in years divisible by four. Ray, any thoughts? No, I'm, I, I, hi, Lindy, how are you? Nice to hear you. <laughs> um, Oh, you know, I, there's a lot of diversity um, in this kind of other world um, that we try to sort of understand through a course like Bridging the American Divide. Um, you know, I think in many respects, uh, these, quote, rural areas are um, not going to be hit as hard because they're not as dense. And density explains a lot of why New York City um, has been the hardest hit of all of the communities in the United States at this stage of the game. On the other hand, there are these horrendous examples um, of meatpacking plants throughout Iowa and South Dakota and Arkansas. And the problem there essentially is that, um, you know, you have a lot of immigrants, many of whom are not quote legal immigrants who are lower class people who have to go to work in oppressive conditions or they're gonna lose their jobs and they are just sitting ducks for horrendous um, episodes that are very concentrated. In some respects, it's much like the concentration of the hit of the virus on um, nursing homes and the like. So, the, so I think in general, the urban, the rural areas are gonna be hit less, but there are gonna be these horrendous hot spots arising from inequality and aging. Switching gears a little bit um, to look at capital markets, and um, maybe this is directed more to our economists. We've got a question from Yugao about the equity capital markets seeming to have um, largely recovered to some extent, but that the recession is going to be devastating on many other levels to the economy. How do you reconcile the two? Well, I think it's probably more for Tano, but I'll give my own two cents. The Fed's interventions have been mammoth. And while they're not doing perhaps as much as the Fed would like to reflate the real economy, they can definitely reflate financial markets because the Fed is squeezing spreads in all manner of debt markets, which are also to the benefit of the equity market. It's also a case that don't confuse the equity market, publicly traded equity market with American business. So part of what I mentioned you know, about trends toward bigness and concentration, that's to the benefit of many large firms and will be reflected in their future profits and priced by the market. Whether that's good for American business, I leave to somebody else, uh, to, somebody else to say. The market, of course, is forward-looking, not backward-looking, and is taking a stance on the timing of, of recovery. But I, I think the Fed's interventions and the bigness and concentration effect shouldn't be lost on people. But I'll defer to Mr. Value Investing to give this yes. perspective. <laughs> so I, I'm going to make a very, you know, sort of a quick comment. I agree entirely with what Glenn has said. I mean, if you think about the market, it has been dominated now for quite a while by four or five companies, the Amazons, Googles, Facebooks of the world. If you think about, uh, uh, and the recovery, by the way, is the recovery to some extent of these companies that are greatly benefiting from this crisis in the sense that this accelerates uh, the movement of a variety of businesses towards the cloud. So it accelerates things that were going to happen in 10 years are happening now in five years. And probably Google 
of Facebook are ideally positioned to benefit from that acceleration of uh, demand. So in that sense, the movement of the market is to a large extent driven by this. Second, as Glenn very well put it, I mean, you know, it, it, the Fed is in the business of removing risk these days uh, by providing plentiful liquidity and removing the left-hand side tail of the distribution. So in that sense, if you combine the acceleration of cash flows that is coming because of this pandemic and the removal of the left-hand side tail of the distribution of outcomes because of the Fed, but also the Congress intervention, then you have you know, it's not, then it's beginning not to be that surprising that the market perhaps has not reacted as much as one would have assumed. Now, it is true this crisis is still very uncertain. We can have a second outbreak. And there are sectors, tourism, I've been looking very closely at hotels and the leisure sector that are going to be impaired for a long, long time. And perhaps permanently because they will have to change their business model. So it is in that segment of the market where you find the real stress. The market can be crazy, but it's not completely crazy in the sense that it distinguishes between those sectors, particularly after two months of being in this mess, these sectors that are going to benefit in from this and those sectors that clearly are going to be impaired for a long time. We have some terrific questions on climate change. Lee Strickler and Sheldon Cheng both asking, you know, how do you think the economies of the world are responding to the fact that it looks like we're at zero emissions uh, when you look at satellite maps and Sheldon's question of um, if you you know are people's risk perceptions changing um, given in light of the pandemic and the global impact that it's had how do you think this current crisis makes us think about climate change in a different way well I think it makes us think about the enormous social problem of climate change it is an existential problem for the world and for the nation I'm not sure I'd want to get to zero emissions by having pandemics. I used to say to people who didn't like trade imbalances, well, you could have a big recession and make that go away, but it doesn't seem optimal. So I think, unfortunately, if we really want to get emissions down, we really need a strategy to do that, which is going to involve both uh, demand reductions, that is using the price system, and innovation. I, I don't think there's a free lunch way of just hoping pandemics will do it, but I'm I'm not a climate science climate scientist. I hope I'm wrong, and there's some cheap and easy way, but I don't know what it is. Well, um, my son, the climate scientist um, Radley, uh, was on television recently, pointing out that uh, there were some things like Zoom meetings that would cut down on the yep. need to uh, drive cars back and forth uh, that would cut down on um, the use of uh, airplanes and their very negative effect. And some of those things may stick um, after the endemic has, uh, the pandemic has abated and would have a, uh, some effect on uh, the issue of climate change, or as I like to call it now, global warming, which is what it really is history of the nomenclature moving from global warming to climate change going back now, I hope, to global warming is very interesting political, politically. In any event, um, uh, it, 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 it remains the killer issue facing the peoples and nations of the world, not the pandemic, but it's climate change. It's a big issue, longer term. So can I add one thing to this? If there's one pedagogical effect of this pandemic is going to teach the world about externalities. I'm still hoping no. that someone draw, draws the kind of fundamental similarity between these two things. They both involve a problem of coordination, of externalities, of negative externalities, and we should harness this particular moment to teach uh, voters and citizens around the world uh, about this fundamental aspect of the problem that you cannot go about it alone. You really need a lot of collaboration to fix it. I agree, but here's the problem. In a pandemic, people are dying today. Yeah. And, and everything happens, it's the way I've tried to explain to people about climate change, it's the difference between a heart attack and cancer. So many political systems are very good with heart attacks. In other words, things that disrupt and kill immediately. Wars come to mind, pandemics. 
but harder on gradual changes that are just as deadly like a cancer is. So I hear you, Tano, and I want to believe, but it's politically still tough. It's still tough to sell it. Well, it's not just politically tough. Um, Part of the reason it's politically tough is that major pieces of American and international business are wedded to making climate worse. And there's a follow-on question from someone asking about sustainability and ESG investing. Do you think that investor markets are going to be more flexible than governments in responding to these, you know, this global um, challenge of climate change? I think ESG considerations are only going to grow in importance. And I think the pandemic has, if anything, magnified them, not made them go away. For a variety of reasons, I've been in presentations with Vanguard and BlackRock and State Street and others uh, in the past couple of weeks, and they've all re-emphasized their commitment uh, to ESG, to the E part, the S part, and the G part. And I think the pandemic only makes that stronger. So I think Climate change approaches will be something institutional investors will be looking for, not for businesses to take a political position, but to say, what's their company's uh, sustainability in that environment? Do you have a business model that would be reasonable absent the externalities to which Tana referred? Just doing a time check, Glenn, because I know you have yeah. a hard stop at 7.30. It's a yeah, great I'm discussion. Have but- to- Ring off unless there's one more pressing question, but I I know you all are in good hands with Tano and with Ray. Um, There was one quick question, or maybe not so quick, from Andrew to you, Glenn, about um, the fiscal spend of the U.S. um, has been really to prevent collapse. Do you agree? The question is whether there's a fiscal end to the U.S.? Uh, Sorry. So the fiscal spend in the U.S. has been really to prevent collapse. Do you agree? I mean, the way I think about the current fiscal spending is it is much like fighting a war. And when we fought World War II, we borrowed so much money, we raised debt to GDP to a little over 100 percent. It fell to about 40 percent by 1960 because we stopped fighting World War II. We had other wars. We stopped fighting World War II and the economy grew and interest rates were low. I'm not too worried about big levels of one time borrowing, provided we do it for the right reason. But the U.S. had a problem before COVID-19. We were on a fiscally unsustainable path. And that hasn't gone away because of COVID-19. So I think we still have hard political choices. They're less about the money we, we just borrowed and much more about the programs we all know about uh, that need to be reformed. All right. Thank you, Glenn. For sure. My pleasure. Words. We appreciate you. All good hands. Thanks, everyone, for joining. Thank you. Can I add one thing to what Glenn said? Because I think it's very important. I think it's going to occupy a lot of our discussions in the modern political ec- economy course in the fall. I think one thing that we're going to reopen, and it's going to be a very difficult conversation societies are going to have in the future, um, matters related to the optimal design of the welfare state. So a welfare state uh, that comes out of the ashes of the Second World War and of the Great Depression is thought for kind of um, business cycle-like recessions where, you know, some temporary insurance will help workers reallocate and regain their job that they lost, you know, a couple of months ago. The type of shocks that we're getting, automatization, globalization, the pandemic, they seem to require different uh, social institutions, different design of some of these welfare state institutions. And one of the things that uh, Glenn brought up uh, before uh, in one of the answers to uh, the question was this issue, for instance, of retraining. How do we actually face uh, these uh, structural shocks that are becoming so pervasive? It is unsurprising uh, citizens around the world uh, are frustrated with the workings of kind of the social liberal democracies that come out of the Second World War because they are not very well suited to actually absorb uh, the type of shocks that we've been um, uh, going through, as Ray pointed out at the very beginning, uh, uh, you know, over the last two decades, the type of enormous shocks that display significant fraction of the population permanently and separate them from their jobs uh, on a permanent basis and renders them obsolete on a human capital basis. Different institutions are needed to tackle that problem. 
to um, draw on your point about training, do you think the idea of um, the move to, to a service industry economy that's been prevalent in the US, do you think that's now not a, not a great idea? Supply chains also changing? In the no, United I mean, States? oh, it's happening. It really doesn't matter. Uh, uh, this is something manufacturing uh, is so competitive that the value added in manufacturing is systematically going down. So manufacturing will be the agricultural of the future. Nobody is proposing that we should have more farmers in our farms. Nobody is suggesting that seriously, I assume. So the same thing with manufacturing, you know, robotization and automatization uh, are here to stay. There's no way around it. It's making us wealthier, even though it's leading to an enormous amount of displacement making, and suffering in some communities. Making some of us wealthier. Huh? <laughs> making some of us wealthier. Yeah, it's making some people wealthier, exactly. It's a distributional issue. At the heart of it is a distributional issue yeah, that needs to that needs to be addressed. But, you know, it's here to stay. We cannot uh, uninvent the robots that are making our cars today. Uh, so, the, the, you know, so we are talking about, you know, we can bring some, perhaps some industries and some production of medical supplies because of national security reasons. But thinking that this is going to bring a significant amount of jobs back, I think that's that's just not going to happen. Like it can, what, what has happened in this country over the last 40 years cannot be reversed because it has to do with forces that are much deeper uh, than purely the type of shocks we've lived through and over the last few years. If we don't deal with that issue, then the great divide in the United States is just going to get greater. Absolutely. And that, um, you know, that as an American, that to me is the thing that bothers me the most about the future. And that is, um, how are we going to figure out a way to narrow, to bridge, if you will, the divide that currently exists? I don't want to see it get bigger. We need to be figuring out how we're going to make it slimmer, smaller, not bigger. Yeah. But I mean, so this is going to require. Uh, having a state that is willing to implement those transfers while at the same time, so you're going to need like a combination of two things. I'm going to take someone who has been displaced and who is disadvantaged on account of his human capital and perhaps his initial condition. And we're going to have to support him, but also give him hope that if you do one, two, three, if I retrain you, if you go to this um, a community college and you learn to do X, Y, and C, there will be a job waiting for you. Much more active policies in that direction uh, seem to be needed to really uh, close that enormous gap that has opened in American society. But there are many frictions. I, I, uh, I held my tongue when Glenn was talking about retraining. There are a lot of frictions um, that work against retraining. Um, one of the things we learned when we were in Youngstown during the first year of the Bridging the American Divide program is that one reason many people in Youngstown were not relocating to other parts of the country is that they had elderly parents to take care of. Yeah. That, you know, that's, that really suggests that one of the ways of dealing with labor mobility is to move to something like um, a national health plan. That's yeah, ab ab uh, absolutely. The fact, you know, for instance, one of the reasons why in Europe people are willing to move is because you never lose access to your health care. You know, it doesn't matter where you live and it doesn't matter where you are, right. in which sector you're working in. That, that removes uh, a friction um, that increases mobility. And given how important mobility is for this society of ours, uh, it, it seems to me a no-brainer that you want to remove that friction while at the same time removing an enormous source of anxiety in people's lives. So absolutely. Um, drawing on that, Jason had a question uh, reflecting on the 2008 crisis. There was more regulation around the banking industry, which seems to have been helpful. Um, would you anticipate other changes in business regulation outside of healthcare in other areas as a result of this? Corona crisis. You want to take it, Ray, or you want me to give it a stab first? Yeah, go ahead. So, I mean, one thing that uh, so can I, let me start with a broader comment about the global financial crisis and the current crisis. 
the global financial crisis, of course, was very scary and very dramatic and made for some great movies. But fundamentally was a crisis that was relatively well diagnosed from the very beginning, in the sense that we knew that the problem was losses in the financial system and the need for additional capital. And there was a big political economy problem of where that capital is gonna be coming from. And of course, Congress was very reluctant to inject taxpayer monies to recapitalize the financial system. Um, and until we found a way of doing this that was politically viable, uh, the crisis remained unresolved. But the moment this was figured out uh, through TARP and then the uh, stress test program, the crisis was as good as over almost. Uh, in Europe, that took a little bit longer because the political economy problems are deeper. Uh, but again, the problem was well diagnosed from the very beginning. The problem here is that the problem is very difficult to diagnose. You know, many sectors are affected very differently. Is it, you know, whatever you think of, fair, leave issues of fairness uh, and justice and uh, equity aside, whatever you may think about the tourism sector, it doesn't play the same role in the American economy as the financial sector. So the question is, if we're gonna spend taxpayer monies in rescuing, say, some hotel companies and the airlines and so on and so forth, is the multiplier the same as if we recapitalize the financial service sector? And these are very difficult discussions to, uh, to be had. So that's the first point. The second point is that the costs are much more widely spread right now. And as Ray was emphasizing before, the need for targeted intervention seems much more acute. So we're not very good at that. We're not very good at, I'm gonna intervene here, but not there. Look at what has happened, for instance, with a small business uh, program. Uh, you know, we put it in a rush, it was well-intentioned, and a lot of money ended up in the hands of Shake Shack or Harvard University, which we'd all agree may not be the organizations that are uh, in most need of taxpayer monies. So we're not very good at targeted interventions. It's not clear what the regulatory response should be beyond public health issues that have a very strong international dimension to them. I would say, uh, uh, again, going back to the election in November, if we have an election in November, that that outcome of that election is going to bear extremely heavily on the whole regulation of business issue. One of the consistent policies of this right-wing populist authoritarian president that we have right now has been to deregulate business. Um, and that deregulation has, in many respects, just been based upon turning around the regulations that were imposed by executive order by Barack Obama during the period that he wasn't able to get anything through Congress. So uh, an election of Joe Biden is gonna mean more regulation. An election of Donald Trump is gonna be a continuation of deregulation in a variety of areas, particularly with respect to the environment and climate change. Steve, there, there I, is a, sorry, there is a question about tariffs. Do you think tariffs might be an exception to that? Because it is being done, it could be done under a protectionist um, mindset, especially around supply chain issues, you know, medical supplies, et cetera. Mm. Tana, my friend. I mean, tariffs involves a complete breakdown of the world we built in the mid uh, to late 90s, the world of the WTO. Now, my sense is that, uh, you know, this is a standard response uh, by political systems in distress is to try to export um, the uh, uh, recession abroad through tariffs and preserve as much as they can of the internal demand and build as much as they can on external demand. Of course, that's a losing game as we have understood now for 200 years since David Ricardo first nailed these issues. Uh, but I agree with you, this is uh, where I'm afraid uh, unless we have healthier uh, political dynamics, that's where we're heading in the near future. And I think it's going to be to the detriment and the wealth of the world is gonna be a very nasty world. It's gonna be very difficult, by the way. It's gonna be very difficult to undo uh, the type of globalization uh, that we have built over the last uh, few years. Now it can be done. 
uh, and we have seen processes of deglobalization uh, before, like the one we've experienced uh, in Europe uh, after the First World War. So, you know, one has to be careful with this. People had very similar discussions, uh, say, in 1914 as to why England and Germany would never go to war with each other. They were deeply integrated economically. They had extensive cultural relations. The elites of both countries intermarried and so on and so forth. And, you know, look at what happened. So, um, you know, and that led to the enormous instability of the 1920s. Now, one should not uh, overemphasize those historical examples. You know, history does not repeat itself. But when it comes to globalization, we have seen uh, steps back before. One of the things I really like about my good friend Tano is that not only is he a really good economist, he's also an extremely good historian. <laughs> I'm not so sure. <laughs> Yeah. Thank you for that. So I'm looking at the time. It's 7.45. Um, any last words before we close out? I know we've gotten so many questions from people. We've, um, we, we also want to respect people's um, outside family commitments and things. But any last thoughts to help us close out the way so forward me, on the modern political economy? So let me take it first so Ray can close, uh, which it seems only appropriate. Um, I think one thing that I want to emphasize to everyone is what Ray has been teaching for years or presciently. In my, you know, he was talking about how opportunities to have economists. I actually, I'm doing this because I want to hang out with a political scientist. I think we've lived the age of the economist. The economist and the economist way of thinking uh, has dominated the policy and public debate for many, many years. Mm -hmm. uh, since I would say, uh, the revolution that started in the late 70s, both in the US and the United Kingdom. Um, and now we're going to have the type of political discussions we haven't had in the West in the last 40 years. And having a good understanding of political dynamics, the interactions, of course, between politics and economics will remain important. Economics remains the constraint under which other societal uh, uh, you know, events uh, happen, of course, but we're going to have a lot of these political discussions uh, going forward where the economist is going to be in the back seat rather than driving the car. So um, I, I sort of started to think about modern political economy um, when I began to realize the limitations of the split between politics, political science, and economics. And I began to realize that really when I began to read Adam Smith way back when, he was really the first person to understand that the political science and economics as we come to later define them uh, and later break apart were completely over, not completely overlapped, but very much overlapped. So that analytically, I think we have a better opportunity to understand what's going on in the world around us, to predict what's going on in the world around us, to adapt to the changes that we foresee in the world around us, and finally, to make the world a better place if we're so inclined. And that's really what I see as the purpose of the course modern political economy. I don't think that will change. But I think to the extent that we can begin to think about the way in which politics and economics are interrelated, interrelated which I think is essentially what you were saying, Tano, we're going to be one step ahead toward getting to those goals of understanding the world around us and ultimately making it a better place. Inshallah. Thank you. Inshallah. <laughs> Inshallah. <laughs> it's a terrific, terrific note to end on. I think, you know, all of us at the Tamer Center for Social Enterprise very much believe in this interdisciplinary perspective in thinking about big societal and environmental issues that the world is facing. So that's, it's been a terrific discussion. Thank you all so much for participating through your questions.
and to our speakers, Professor Ray Horton, Hannah Santos, and, and Glenn Hubbard. So we hope to have continu continuing discussions and maybe we can press you all to do an alumni version of your MPE course through executive education so we can enjoy some more of these discussions. Thank you all. Have Thanks for organizing this, Sandra. Thank you very much, everyone. Thank you. Thank you, Ray. Thank you, Sandra.